Hello, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Christoph Zenich, and I'm being joined here today by Ellen. Um, and normally, um, we would also have had uh, Sven uh, with us, but Sven is uh, currently uh, out with um, illness. So um, if we look at what we're going to cover um, on the agenda for today, then um, we will first have um, an overview of what is happening um, globally, um, some trends, uh, some things we see happening that influence all of us uh, in our day-to-day -day business. Uh, subsequently, we will have uh, a look at some country updates um, we will have uh, some interviews with people uh, from across uh, the globe within the policy network, uh, after which uh, we'll have a look at what this all uh, means for us in terms of digital tax compliance um, and also in our wider processes in company, both uh, reporting and uh, AP and AR. So uh, from there, uh, let's perhaps have uh, a quick look at some of those drivers that impact us uh, on the global front. Uh, and perhaps before I do that, uh, just a quick reminder that there is a chat function in which um, we can um, see some questions popping in. We'll not per se have time um, to take these questions um, in the webinar itself, but uh, we will certainly come back to them uh, after the webinar if you have uh, specific questions. All right. so. If we switch then to our global overview slide, we're not going to dwell on this, but nonetheless, it's important to have a look at some of those influencing factors. Uh, first of all, there is uh, globalization and global technological uh, disruption that made that uh, supply chains globally, business setups, uh, organizations have changed their way of working, and meaning that the classical tax functions do not, uh, that excuse me, the, the typical or the classical ways in which tax authorities collected taxes are no longer apt to our global uh, environment. On top of that, we see that a lot of treasuries are in need of cash, and this has just been reinforced under the currently ongoing uh, pandemic. Now, if we see authorities looking uh, for uh, cash and means of financing uh, their national operations, then as I said, uh, business models are changing, and so the classical direct taxes models are no longer apt. So that, uh, on the one hand, means that they need to look for another uh, way of taxation. If you then also know that direct taxes are um, above uh, their top in the sense that corporate taxes um, are mainly used as a means of competition between countries rather than as a means to increase uh, tax collection, uh, that clearly means that authorities need to consider uh, indirect taxes. Uh, next to that, we also see um, a trend uh, of protectionism, uh, meaning that um, on the back of what uh, we can uh, have called trade wars, whereby we saw uh, authorities using um, uh, customs duties as a means to, um, to favor uh, national production rather than uh, seeing imported products, uh, that is just adding to this shift from uh, direct taxes uh, to indirect taxes. Uh, next to that, we see um, the public opinion um, where the tax morality debate, uh, debate kicks in, um, where we see that uh, people are expecting uh, taxpayers to pay their fair share um, and not to try to quibble with that. Um, th that, al that also has a, a, an impact on uh, what uh, companies and taxpayers are expected uh, and required to uh, show in terms of transparency. And so this then leads to additional initiatives around regulatory uh, disclosure. So that means companies being required by tax authorities to report, to additionally report. Uh, and we see that both at the level of the uh, direct taxes, uh, where we, for example, have seen country by country reporting and the likes, but also at the level of indirect taxes, where um, real-time reporting, mandatory electronic invoicing, uh, near real-time reporting, standard audit files, et cetera, et cetera, are popping up at a extremely high rate over uh, the past years. Now, 
Providing all that information to tax authorities is one thing. Uh, on the other hand, we also see that tax authorities are using and uh, starting to use this information in different uh, manners. It's not just uh, used for uh, spot audits, but rather we see that in-country tax authorities will exchange uh, gradually more information across uh, different tax sources, but also um, national tax authorities across borders are exchanging uh, more and more information, meaning that uh, additional means are available uh, to tax authorities to uh, spot anomalies or raise questions. Um, that is then combined with when audits are triggered, um, electronic audits, of course, data mining uh, driven audits. So that is an additional uh, layer of um, scrutiny that can be applied and that can require uh, taxpayers uh, to be on top of their operations and making sure that they are comfortable that what they provide uh, to tax authorities is true and reflects reality and their operations in a correct manner and making sure that there's no contradictions in anything they would uh, exchange because that risks them uh, to trigger uh, audits. Uh, that links back to a last point I have on this slide and that's in relation to tax governance uh, where um, some tax authorities we will see not only require uh, additional information uh, to be exchanged, but also require uh, taxpayers to show how they're on top of their operations, to show uh, by a control framework how they uh, can be comfortable what they provide is indeed correct. So that is uh, the tax authorities pushing that agenda, but at the same time, uh, we clearly see that many of these trends um, require businesses to be on top of their operations, to know what they exchange. Um, and that means that as a company, you, you generally would want uh, to digitize as much as possible your processes so that early on in the game, uh, you can um, as optimally as possible uh, verify what you have as data within your company before you are then uh, required to, uh, to exchange it. So now Ellen uh, will take over from me um, and, and take you through some of these uh, global trends we see happening. Thank you, Christoph. Indeed. Um, let's now look a, a bit closer to what impact these mega trends, uh, the, what, we, what we just learned from Christoph, has to, um, let's say, the global tax uh, and compliance reporting landscape. Um, as we have just learned, it's clear that governments indeed want to obtain more of your company's data. And if you look at, at the visual um, with the flags on the, on the slide just now, uh, you can see that the number of countries that have implemented these types of requirements um, over a very short period of time have really um, tripled uh, over this period. Um, where only a few years ago, there were only a small number of countries that had implemented these types of requirements um, in their, in their uh, local legislation. You see them now popping up at a very fast pace. Um, and those requirements, um, they vary, and, and Christophe already referred to it, from what we call the on-request e-audit requirements, so the SAFT, the Standard Audit Files for Tax, where governments indeed want to obtain um, your accounting information in a predefined structured format in order to be able to conduct very targeted audits to that data set. Um, it also includes countries that have implemented what we call uh, real-time reporting obligations, um, meaning that um, these countries want to obtain your transactional information, your invoice information, very closely after you have issued um, your invoice towards the buyer. Um, also, let's say, um, yeah, as a, as a predefined uh, set of information, either the full invoice information or just a smaller subset of that invoice information. And then thirdly, um, a step further, I would say, are the, the invoicing mandates, um, where you are no longer sending your invoice directly towards your buyer, but where you first need to send it to a government, either for pre-clearance or even a step further, where the government or the government platform is also the one um, sending that invoice actually towards your buyer. What can we now expect for the years to come? Um, first of all, there are a number of important EU policy developments that we um, need to take into account that will clearly have an impact to the VAT reporting and invoicing landscape as we know it today. Um, first of all, there's a VAT gap. Um, the VAT gap is, is the difference between the expected VAT revenues in a country 
and uh, the amount those member states have actually collected. And you see that the VAT gap is, is often uh, wrongly confused with, let's say, VAT losses due to uh, tax frauds. Um, but it's important to know that it's more than that. It's also linked, for instance, to a malfunctioning um, VAT collection process, um, to administrative mistakes, to bankruptcies and things like that. Um, the European Commission has very recently published its uh, VAT gap study that showed that uh, for 2018, um, 140 billions of euros um, is the actual VAT gap in Europe, um, which means, let's say, a marginal improvement of that VAT gap as compared to the previous years. But, and that's important, um, Estimates for 2020 already show a reversal of that trend, meaning that um, they expect a higher VAT gap in the future due to the impact um, of the corona pandemic on, uh, let's say, the overall economy. Another important development is that over the summer, the European Commission has published its um, action plan for fair and simple taxation. Um, including a number of initiatives they want to take between now and 2024. And one of these initiatives specifically deals with the fact that the Commission wants to implement measures to help Member States uh, really enforce existing tax legislation. Um, and they uh, are looking into publishing a proposal to modernize uh, the VAT reporting obligations by introducing more real-time obligations um, and to also explore to what extent electronic invoicing um, should be further expanded in the future. So you see that with all of that, and, and also important is that that commission uh, proposal has been fully confirmed by the council last week. So with, with all that in mind, it's of course um, important to note that um, a lot of additional changes uh, also in Europe are expected uh, in the future. When we now spend some time on, let's say, the more regional uh, geographical trends, uh, we can see a, a quite scattered landscape, I would say. Um, North America, the United States, uh, typically has a very open framework to electronic invoicing. However, we see ongoing initiatives um, going on, uh, for instance, uh, launched by the Business Payments Coalition in the United States, in order to increase the uptake of e-invoicing uh, on the U.S. market, to create a standard and to create an interoperability framework that really fits for the U.S. market. And you see that the U.S. is very closely looking at what is happening in Europe, for instance, with, with Apple, um, to that extent. On the other hand, if we move to, to Latin America, you see that the Latin American region has typically been one of the four uh, front runners, let's say, uh, when it comes to electronic invoicing. Um, with clearance-based uh, invoicing models being implemented in most of the Latin American countries by now. And, and did this with a clear aim to fight against um, tax fraud. The Middle Eastern region um, is a region that is subject to further changes in the future. Um, VAT has been only recently introduced in the GCC countries. And you can also already see that um, the various GCC countries are exploring to what extent they would like to improve their VAT compliance obligations and their VAT collection process. But we'll hear more about that later in the international panel discussion. Also, the Asia-Pacific region is in full development for the moment, uh, some with open models, looking very closely again at what is happening in Europe. Uh, for instance, um, the introduction of PEPL in Australia, in New Zealand very recently, and other countries with more stringent clearance-based models. The same goes a bit, I would say, for the African region. Um, you see that the uptake of electronic invoicing and electronic reporting obligations is still rather low in this region. But you see, on the other hand, that some countries are already exploring, taking the first steps towards the introduction um, of an e-reporting or e-invoicing system. Before, before we now move into uh, our international panel discussion, we'd like to raise uh, a question to you. Um, and the question is whether or not you have currently a clear view on the e-invoicing and e-reporting -re requirements that are relevant for your business. I'll give you some time to respond to the query.
In just a few moments more. Okay, let's take a look. So we see that, well, although um, some of the some of the uh, companies are indeed, let's say, aware of um, their roadmap, um, I think there's some some further work to be done, and and we hope, of course, uh, to be able to to help with that uh, exercise in uh, the next uh, the next few minutes, where we will show you um, a bit more of what is happening around the globe in terms of uh, e-invoicing and e-reporting uh, requirements. All right, let's move now to the uh, next section, which is uh, the country updates. Um, during the next couple of minutes, uh, and following with what we've just learned about uh, the global, the regional trends, we'll go in a bit more detail um, on the rules and changes uh, on electronic invoicing and electronic reporting in a number of countries. And for this, I'm glad that I'm not alone, but I'm uh, supported by a few of our key country experts who will explain you in more detail what is going on in their respective countries in relation to mandated electronic invoicing and transactional reporting. We'll start with uh, a few countries close by. Uh, the first one being Poland, um, one of the countries in the EU that has invested heavily in the implementation of measures to tackle VAT fraud, with success, by the way. And we've asked Krzysztof Kamieniak, who is a manager in our indirect tax team in Poland, to summarize the current situation on electronic invoicing in Poland. So let's hear what Krzysztof has to say. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Krzysztof Kamieniak, and I'm an indirect tax manager in PwC Poland's Poznań office. I am very pleased to give you an update regarding Polish e invoicing developments, including B2G, B2C, and B2B relationships. Let's begin with uh, business to government transactions. Poland adopted an act on e invoicing in public procurement and starting from April 2019, obliged Polish state, regional, and local authorities and organizations to accept e invoices. However, the mechanism still remains voluntary for the suppliers. The invoicing takes place via a central electronic invoicing platform or Platforma Elektronicznego Fakturowania, which works with the PEPL network. Using the platform is free of charge. Uh, apart from electronic invoices, the electronic invoicing platform allows users to exchange additional voluntary documents, including orders, dispatch advice, receiving advice, correcting invoices, and accounting notes. At the moment, the Polish authorities are working on the development of the current functionalities of the platform so that it can process what they call specialist invoices. So for example, invoices for the supply of gas, electricity, or telecommunication services. The expected date of the completion of the project is the first quarter of 2022. Now, moving on to B2C sales, uh, Poland has been rolling out an online cash register system in recent years. The obligation to use online cash registers uh, is being introduced in phases, uh, starting from the sectors which the, the Ministry of Finance considers most liable to VAT fraud, so for example, sale of petrol. There is a central system called uh, Centralne Repositorium CAS, or Central Repository of Cash Registers, to collect and process data received from online cash registers. Uh, importantly, however, it is evident that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has clearly accelerated the digitization of B2C sales. It is now legally allowed to issue cash receipts to customers in an electronic format if you have an online cash register. Finally, considering business-to-business uh, -business transactions, Polish regulations do not go beyond what is normally met in EU member states. Businesses exchange invoices in PDF forms and also using mechanisms like EDI. Of course, authenticity of origin, integrity of content and legibility of an invoice are the essential principles guiding electronic exchange of invoices. However, it's still not a mandatory process to use e-invoices in B2B relationships. So while not being a digitization leader in terms of e-invoicing, I think we can say that, that Poland is on a steady path 
towards electronic exchange of building documents. So we heard Krzysztof mention that there is currently no business-to-business uh, -business e invoicing mandate in place. However, you might have also heard the rumors lately um, basically indicating something else uh, following an announcement from the Polish Ministry of Finance uh, just before the summer. So we asked Krzysztof to also share some further insights on these announcements, um, on the plans of the Polish governments, which also seem to go beyond the region of, uh, beyond, sorry, um, the Polish borders, as the initiative is really supported by other countries in the CEE region. So over again to Krzysztof. We do not have very much information in this respect beyond what the representatives of the Ministry of Finance communicate in press interviews. There have been talks about a central register of invoices for many years now, but this idea has not materialized yet. On the other hand, from mid 2016, Polish and foreign taxpayers operating in Poland have to submit standard audit files for tax or SAFTIs and the tax authorities have been developing significant analytical capabilities around this solution, which is ledger rather than e-invoice based. Nevertheless, the recent signals from the Ministry of Finance seem to suggest that the ministry is seriously considering introducing in Poland a real-time reporting mechanism based on electronic exchange of invoices via a state platform. The dates coming up in these interviews are mid-2021 or the year 2022, and the Italian model is mentioned by representatives of the Ministry as the one which Poland may choose to follow. So, in conclusion, I would say that uh, a lot of activity is expected in Poland, but also in the Ryder region, uh, so the local developments there are clearly something to be very closely followed up. Um, let's move on to the next country in the list, namely Greece, um, also a country where we heard a lot of these days, given their move towards the My Data real-time reporting obligations. Um, we have asked Angelos Benos, uh, who is a tax partner in our team in Greece and responsible within um, PwC for the My Data project, to give you an update on the recent developments in Greece. Hello, everyone. This is Angelos Benos from uh, Athens, Greece. I uh, hope you're enjoying uh, today's session. Greece is one more country that adapts to the new era and the new digital world by introducing my data and the invoicing. The uh, new requirements uh, will be in place from 1st January 2021, where businesses will be required to basically exchange information with the local authorities through a platform and in real time. These transactions that need to be exchanged with the Greek authorities include pretty much all transactions, transactions between uh, businesses, B2C transactions and transactions with the government, B2G transactions. Now, there are no real thresholds, so, so all uh, companies or the vast majority of the companies will be affected uh, and the only ones that will be exempt are very, very small companies uh, that I don't believe it is relevant for the international businesses and even those very, very small companies operating in Greece will have to adapt to a new era but in a simplified version, meaning that there's a simplified way to exchange information with the local authorities. Now, given the very tight deadlines, obviously businesses have spent the second half of the year, uh, 2020 year, uh, preparing themselves for going live in a couple of months. This is not straightforward for everyone. Some businesses are probably a little bit more ready to adapt to the new situation. Uh, some businesses will require more time in doing so. There are no severe penalties for the first year of the My Data application, meaning that penalties will be imposed only if you do not exchange information but if for any reason you exchange the wrong data or you miss a deadline, that's all right. 
there is not going to be a punitive approach from the authorities. So um, I think the next few months, um, our business and our um, scope here is to help the businesses prepare and obviously hold their hand in going live uh, from 1st of January 2021. Um, as always, um, you know, some businesses are excited about it, some other businesses feel this is adding to the whole burden of dealing with the authorities. I think in a year from today, looking at how other countries and other businesses have adapted to the new era, I think in a year from now, everything will be going back to normal, but digital. Thanks. So it's clear from what Angelo still told us that the My Data obligations will have indeed a huge impact uh, on businesses that are active in Greece. Um, one of the questions that I uh, receive quite frequently over the last few months is how the My Data obligations will impact the current e-invoicing process. So I also asked Angelo to provide us with some further insights on this topic as well. Well, in terms of how my data interacts with the invoicing, I believe the answer is fairly straightforward. E-invoicing is one of the ways to transmit data to the local authorities. Data that are purely transactional though, and the local requirements go beyond transactional data. Now, businesses are incentivized to adapt the invoicing and there are key and very interesting incentives on offer. First of all, businesses are entitled to the super deduction regime, which means that if you spend 10,000 euros on equipment, on systems, on training, anything to do with setting up the interface in order to adapt and join the e-invoicing process, you get 100% of super deduction, so you will be able to deduct 20,000 instead of 10,000, which is basically 24% incentive here based on the local corporate tax rate. The other incentives include dropping the statute of limitations, meaning this is moving from five years to four years for the businesses that adapt the invoicing. And the third incentive has to do with the expedition of the tax refunds because businesses that adapt e invoicing are going to move from 90 days to 45 days for tax refunds. So, in summary, even though Greece is clearly trying to give a boost to the uptake of electronic invoicing through the various incentives uh, it is providing for, they are not yet going as far as, for instance, Italy by imposing a real B2B invoicing mandate. Let's now move over to the to the next country on the list, um, being France. Uh, a lot of noise uh, these days around France, um, and many companies and service providers are keen to know which direction the upcoming e-invoicing B2B mandate or real-time reporting obligation will take. As the developments in France are fairly new, um, with uh, only last week a, a report being published uh, to the Parliament, I've asked Brecht, uh, who is a senior associate in our global COE, to provide us with his take on the recent developments in France. Bonjour à tous. Thanks for having me. Um, the next couple of minutes, I have the pleasure of sharing with you some further insights on what is going on in France in the field of e-invoicing and e-reporting. As some of you might already know, uh, France already implemented an electronic invoicing mandate um, in the framework of B2G transactions. So meaning that uh, taxpayers contracting with the French government are already obliged to issue invoices in electronic format. With the aim of combating bad fraud and driven by the global accelerated pace of change already touched upon earlier today by my colleagues in this webinar, uh, the French government is now also looking into the possibility to generalize electronic invoicing uh, between taxable persons. In order to support this modernization of economic transactions, the French government has decided to broaden the scope of electronic invoicing by extending the invoicing mandate to all domestic transactions uh, between companies starting from Jan 2023. 
Um, in this respect, um, and in line with Article 153 of the Finance Law for 2020, uh, the VGFIP um, submitted its report on uh, VAT and a digital agent grants to Parliament. In their proposal, uh, the VGFIP has analysed um, models from multiple countries, rating their pros and cons uh, for each model to really look at what is now the best fit for France. So, and in the report, two uh, solutions are presented, or two models are presented. Um, on the one hand, you have the V model. In this model, um, invoices will need to be transmitted through the public platform, uh, which is then the only one authorized to ensure the transmission of invoices to the customer. And secondly, you have the Y model. Um, and in this model, certain private platforms certified as trusted uh, third parties will be authorized to send invoices directly um, from the supplier to the buyer or to the recipient companies without going through uh, the public platform. It will then be those uh, certainly so those private platforms who would accordingly extract the information um, intended for the administration uh, and send them to the um, authorities. The different rate stakeholders who worked at the report clearly expressed their preference for the Y model uh, because as in this model, private operators can ensure transmission while managing the different types of billing formats, uh, but it also offers more flexibility, um, especially for companies that have already been able to set up electronic invoicing flows via private platforms, which would therefore, of course, limit uh, the cost of adaptation, uh, which is definitely an important factor to take into account. Um, furthermore, the report also stresses that uh, this electronic invoicing obligation uh, cannot extend to all transactions carried out by a taxable person, um, in particular due to the lack of harmonization um, of the rules applicable to electronic invoicing at European level, but also worldwide, as well as uh, the absence of the obligation to issue invoices within, for example, the framework of uh, B2C transactions. Thus, um, in order to fight effectively against fat fraud, uh, France also indicated that the envisaged e-invoicing model will be supplemented by the transmission of invoicing data or e-reporting. Um, so what France is looking for is really a mixed model between on the one hand your e-invoicing um, obligation, on the other hand also e-reporting. So they will combine uh, both elements. When we then look um, at the envisaged implementation timeline, uh, the report stresses the impact that such a reform uh, could have on businesses. Uh, so therefore, they opt for a gradual implementation of the envisaged model. Um, in particular, as from 2023, all companies will need to be able to receive um, invoice in electronic format. Um, and accordingly, depending on the size of the company, they will also be required to issue um, invoices uh, electronically. So starting from 2023 with the large companies who will need to be able to issue uh, invoices electronically, followed uh, by the mid-sized companies in 2024, and finally also SMEs uh, will need to be able to issue invoices electronically by 2025. So the DGFIP report is already a really major step forward uh, in the implementation um, of the envisaged um, electronic um, e-invoicing uh, uh, and the um, electronic invoicing solutions for, uh, for French companies. But nevertheless, many points uh, remain unanswered um, and will have to be clarified over the coming months uh, with all players. Uh, so therefore, several workshops will be held over the coming months with all stakeholders in order to arrive uh, at the best mixed model, uh, winning the broadest possible consensus. So that was it, a short wrap up on France, and uh, enjoy the rest of the session. So clearly interesting times in France. Um, let's now move um, a bit beyond the European borders uh, and look at some of the recent developments in some of the countries in the Middle East. Uh, those countries like UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia have fairly new VAT systems being implemented. We also heard very recently that Oman is on its way towards a very rapid implementation of VAT already by April 21. Um, in addition to that, we also saw uh, Saudi Arabia making a very surprising move uh, to increase its VAT rate, standard VAT rate, from 5 to a stunning 15%. So it means that it, it's also crucial, and I already referred to that before, for those countries to have, let's say, a well-functioning VAT collection process in place. Uh, we asked Jay Rich, who is a partner in our team and a tax and legal uh, digital service leader in the Middle East, 
uh, to share with us his perspective on the current situation on electronic invoicing in the Middle East region. Hey, good day, everybody. It's uh, it's Jay Rich, um, digital solutions leader for uh, for um, PwC here in the Middle East. Uh, nice to be with you all today. So I was asked to talk a little bit about um, uh, digital tax compliance and e-invoicing in, in the Middle East. So I, I, I'll I'll say it's a very interesting time for us uh, here in this part of the world. Uh, even if you if you step back for a second and think about what's happening and what's happened from a tax transformation perspective over the past two or three years. Uh, it really, really has been a, a hotbed for, for tax transformation. We've seen three countries implement VAT just in the past couple of years. Three more countries um, likely to implement VAT in, in the coming little while, let's say. Um, and a whole host of other tax transformation, whether it's transfer pricing, withholding tax, and, and, and other conversations around um, corporate tax and maybe even personal tax at, at some point in the future. Everything is on the table right now. Um, what's interesting about that landscape against the backdrop of technology, of course, is we're in a part of the world where there hasn't really been tax infrastructure before the implementation of, of, of VAT um, just a couple of years ago. So what that means is for a lot of our clients uh, and also for the taxing authorities here, using technology is, is, is a rather novel uh, a novel initiative. Why it's, why it's really cool and I think why they've been able to leapfrog maybe what's happening in a lot of other countries is because there wasn't a lot of infrastructure in the first place. Uh, to have to move out of the way before you digitized. So, so we are seeing a lot of governments here move, making a, a really, really quick move towards uh, making tax digital. And, and, the, and the first phase of that that they're moving towards is really around e-invoicing. Um, I, I can say quite confidently that the government of Saudi Arabia, Gazet, the taxing authority there, has made, uh, has made a lot of noise in the past little while around implementing an e-invoicing platform. And just a couple of weeks ago, actually, issued uh, some regulations for, for public uh, consultation uh, due sometime in October of this year, of, of 2020, seeking input from the public on what the e-invoicing platform will look like. So, so I would say Saudi is, is sort of front and center uh, leading the charge in, in this part of the world. And, and in addition to that, uh, Egypt is going live this fall with a proof of concept for, for about 100 taxpayers on their first iteration of an e-invoicing platform. Uh, we know uh, the government of Jordan is probably not far behind. Uh, Qatar and potentially even the UAE, where, 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 I'm, where I'm based here in Dubai, uh, is not that far behind uh, also in the sense that they have known initiatives around moving towards uh, digital compliance. So, so we'll see what the next few years look like. But really, we, we are expecting and we are talking to, to taxpayers and also some of our public sector clients around what this means for them and how they can adapt to this uh, landscape as, uh, as, as time goes forward. We know that uh, the GCC region, uh, following the implementation of uh, its VAT system, has also been working on a system like we know it in the EU uh, to make sure there is sufficient uh, exchange of information between the different Gulf states. Um, I also asked uh, Jay the question, to what extent the future invoicing models um, and that information exchange system, uh, to what extent those systems will be interlinked? Yeah, this is an interesting question, and, and it's a, a little bit more difficult to hypothesize around, to, to, to be honest. There is definitely uh, an inter-GCC agreement and a framework around how, how the countries in the GCC will administer VAT, at, at least, or VAT at least, when all the countries um, effectively implement v VAT. Right? You know, and again, we're, we're only three countries out of six so far in, in the fall of 2020 that have done that. So, so one would hypothesize that if, if you can imagine a situation where all countries uh, if not VAT, uh, continue to transform their tax um, tax platforms, including implement VAT, excise tax, um, and then you have e-invoicing bubbling up or, or being implemented in, in, in several of these countries, most notably Saudi or the UAE, Qatar. <clears throat> um, you, you could envision a situation where they harmonized that system and had a, and had a standing platform. We, we have not, to be clear though, we have not heard uh, anything or much around um, a framework like that being being put together. I, I think the more likely scenario, at least in the short and midterm, and, and by midterm I mean, you know, next few years in, into most of the next decade, 
we'll probably see the, the main countries in the GCC and the broader Middle East um, build and implement the digital compliance platform, get that platform uh, up and running and standing uh, within, within its country, and then probably look to, to have some kind of um, inter inter GCC agreement, but but I but I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest that that's the the current direction of travel. I, I would say what will likely happen most uh, in, in the short to midterm, where you'll see two or two or three of these countries uh, get a platform up and running and, and make it a success, and then and, and then we'll see how it goes. From there. The next country that we will zoom into is China. Uh, I'm very pleased to have received a great update on the current situation uh, for electronic invoicing for both the special VAT invoices and the general uh, VAT invoices from uh, Yolanda Lu, who is a partner in our uh, Shanghai office. Hi, everyone. This is Yolanda Lu from PwC China Shanghai office. Today I will share some recent update for China e-invoice to all of you. As you know, in China, uh, the government required the taxpayer to issue tax invoice on top of the commercial invoice for all the transactions. Uh, the tax invoice has its standard format and it's a paper invoice. And also they, they have uh, uh, two categories of the invoice. Uh, one is the special VAT invoice applicable to B2B business. Another is the general tax invoice applicable to the B2C business. Actually, starting from 2015, the China government has already launched the e-invoice. But at that time, uh, only general VAT invoice is within the scope. And uh, what changed for this year, actually this year is the big year uh, for the digitalization for China tax uh, government. Uh, because uh, they finally decided to include a special tax invoice into the pilot program. And also they start to enforce the taxpayer uh, to join the e-invoice for the general VAT invoice. Uh, so there are uh, actually three ways for taxpayer to issue the e-invoice. One is the public uh, uh, e-invoice platform uh, that is provided by the government and uh, uh, for free to offer to the taxpayer. But the function uh, in this public platform is very limited. And the second uh, uh, way is by using the uh, third-party e-invoice service provider. Uh, there are already has uh, around 10 to 20 uh, service provider has already uh, uh, obtained the certification from the tax bureau. Uh, they can offer the e-invoice relevant service uh, to the taxpayer. And the third one is the new option. The new option is uh, for the taxpayer who want to uh, build its own e-invoice platform uh, because the government has already issued the technical standard and the requirement uh, to the taxpayer. So they can, uh, based on the application, uh, and to build its own e-invoice uh, platform. But so far, there's no uh, real case. Uh, uh, basically, most of the uh, uh, company is wait and see uh, the detailed uh, requirements. So we heard from Yolanda more about the pilot program that was launched recently in relation to special uh, EVAT invoices. And I was, of course, eager uh, to understand from her uh, whether there are already some results of, of how that pilot is running and whether it's indeed likely that there will be an actual um, B2B invoicing mandate in the future. So I also asked Yolanda that question. And the pilot actually starting from uh, September the 1st. The first city uh, to be included is Ningbo. Uh, and the expectation is by the end of this year, uh, the tax bureau can uh, let the taxpayer voluntarily join the pilot program for the special VAT invoice. And uh, I don't expect uh, in the near future they will enforce the taxpayer to uh, issue the e-invoice. But for the general VAT invoice, uh, the tax bureau has already started to enforce the taxpayer uh, to draw in. So for the general VAT invoice, 
uh, I will see a very quick move, and the taxpayer uh, will have to issue the e invoice. Last but not least on our country tour is uh, India. Uh, companies having operations in India um, will know that uh, an invoicing mandate for B2B and in some uh, cases also, also B2C transactions already kicked off uh, earlier this fall. And I asked Gautam Qatar, who is a partner in our indirect access practice in uh, PwC India, to give us a brief overview of the mandate, um, how it will potentially evolve in the future, and how companies are currently dealing with uh, their requirements. Hello, everyone. I'm Gautam Khatta, partner in the indirect tax practice in PwC India. Recently, the government of India has introduced invoicing system, which is not only going to transform the administration of indirect taxes, but also the way business operate in India. Effective 1st October 2020, for companies having turnover of more than approximately $67 million uh, have been covered under the invoicing regime. All B2B transactions for such companies are required to comply with the e invoicing requirement. For B2C, for such companies, the government has given a date of 1st December 2020, and that is limited to having QR code, which is a dynamic QR code on the invoice. As we see the roadmap of the government, the proposal is that by 1st Jan 2021, companies having turnover of approximately more than 30 million would also get covered under the invoicing network. It is not only B2B transactions, but supplies to SCZ and exports, which are going to be covered under the invoicing regime. Also, when you look at documents, it's not only the tax document, but also the credit and debit notes, which are, are applicable under GST, would also be required to comply with the invoicing requirement. Our past experience shows that companies should really look at solutions which have a robust validation mechanism and provide for seamless forward and reverse integration with the government uh, portal. In addition, companies should have controls on AP and AR site. When you look at AR, no invoicing should be done without having the invoicing details on the invoices. And on the AP side, probably look at controls to monitor payments to vendors where the invoicing requirements have not been met because without those, the invoice would not be a valid invoice and therefore it will result in a tax cost to the companies. Hope this has given you some insight into how invoicing regime in India is panning out. Thank you. With that, let's now uh, zoom into how digital tax compliance and the increased exchange of information will impact businesses and how you can deal with uh, with with this uh, as a business in uh, the best way forward. Uh, I think, Christoph, over to you. Yes. Tell us more. Thank you, this. Alan. So uh, this section, we're going to start with a uh, little testimonial from Peter. Peter is a member of our international uh, tax team and will give us some further flavors as to how of what we heard from a uh, mainly indirect tax perspective correlates to the wider direct tax perspective uh, on the one hand and what we see happening there uh, more broadly in relation to uh, exchange of information and what it means for all of us. Hello everyone, my name is Peter Dere and I'm a colleague of Ellen and Christophe based in Brussels uh, but active in the international tax world, so more from a corporate tax perspective. I'm very happy at this point in the seminar uh, to share a little bit my, my view, my thoughts on how the developments that you have been uh, discussing from a VAT perspective are also relevant from a corporate tax perspective. Because indeed, we have seen the same developments in direct taxes that you have experienced in indirect tax. We have seen much more and timely information that is available to the tax authorities um, from a corporate tax perspective. 
One key development that we have seen in the past months is the introduction of DAC6. DAC6 is a update of a European directive on administrative cooperation. And this um, directive provides that tax advisors, also businesses, have to share proactively information on certain transactions with the authorities. And this within 30 days. This is a very short period of time for corporate taxes. Eh? So it's unprecedented uh, that information is provided so quickly to the authorities. Um, but the, the tendency and transparency is not the only tendency that we see. We see also very important developments in the tax rules itself. So from a corporate tax perspective, the tax information is going hand in hand with um, the new rules and new developments uh, for authorities to actually assess taxes. Eh? And one um, key development that we have seen here is, of course, the allocation of taxing rights for more digital um, activities. Um, nowadays, all businesses are digital or are digitalizing. So this is, of course, a very hot topic. And from a corporate tax perspective, this is translated into the concept of withholding tax and permanent establishments. If you are active in a certain jurisdiction and you perform significant commercial activities in that country, you are um, likely to have a permanent establishment, a taxable presence in that country. Um, more and more information that is being shared from an indirect tax perspective is also used by the authorities to assess the tax model, tax position from a direct tax perspective. You can imagine that if um, a, a significant amount of information, transactional data uh, is made available uh, because of e-invoicing platforms and so on, uh, that this information is extremely valuable also for a corporate tax inspector who is looking whether um, your, your profits are allocated to the right country and to the right jurisdiction. So here there's a very clear link between what you have been discussing uh, in the seminar today uh, and what I see happening in the corporate tax world. I think in the next um, years to come, we will much more uh, talk with each other because gradually um, my anticipation, my expectation is that uh, VAT authorities and corporate tax authorities will cooperate more and more um, in, in their audits, in their assessments of uh, uh, taxes in, in Europe and beyond. So uh, I wish you a very good continuation of the seminar. Uh, and I hope that uh, we can meet at some point uh, in real life uh, when all this is over. Thank you. Okay, so that was Peter. Um, now, if we bring all of that together before we move to our close uh, in a short number of minutes, um, a brief word on control frameworks, because clearly, like I said also in my introduction, all of these requirements coming to taxpayers require everybody to be on top of their operations. Uh, now, there has been already uh, for quite a number of years some requirements uh, with different levels of uh, stringency and tax relevance uh, out there. So if we go way back, well, way back, um, then we can look at the uh, SUX controls uh, imposed on all businesses, uh, not just uh, U.S. companies, uh, not just, uh, if you wish, uh, financial information. It is also tax relevant. It is not specifically designed for tax, but at least requires companies to have uh, processes, controls to check, checks, etc. Um, we move uh, from there over time to specific tax control frameworks, which have typically been prescribed uh, by governments uh, on a either a voluntary basis or a stimulated basis. Uh, in, in well, starting a number of countries on a mandatory basis, but so that is really aimed at providing how you're on top of your tax operations. Uh, and then from there we started moving, and that's also where it gets interesting. Um, in relation to invoicing, for example, business controls being proposed. So that's basically building on some of the controls that have been put forward under uh, SOX and under tax control framework, starting from uh, the philosophy that a business should, in light of their operations as a whole, uh, internal controls you anyway want to have, but also some of these controls required by governments, you anyway should have a decent set of controls as a business. Therefore, linking that to the invoicing process, saying, well, if you have these controls in place, we would expect that you can, through, for example, mashing procedures, three-way or more mashing, um, you can demonstrate that what is on an invoice is not just an, a standalone sort of uh, or set of data, but really fits into a wider process and therefore uh, provides guarantees as to authenticity 
and integrity. Proven more hard in practice than it is on paper to deploy because uh, not all countries uh, had the same uh, way of looking at that. But anyway, moving from mandatory control frameworks to the um, more upside of things, if you wish, um, that was in relation to the invoicing. Now, the last um, point here on the, the left bottom uh, box is in relation to government controlled invoicing and real time reporting. Uh, this is not a, a sort of legislation that requires control frameworks. I would say this is a sort of uh, complement to all uh, the different uh, layers of control and control frameworks we had before. This is where, as a business, you want to have one. You need to have one. You cannot afford not to be in control. You cannot afford not to have a documented uh, process around uh, your um, APAR, around your return data. You cannot afford not to be on top of your data. You cannot afford to uh, know where what is sitting and who's controlling what. Because you're exchanging so fast with governments globally, you're exchanging across direct and indirect access so simply. This has become a business requirement and so um, should feed up all the way back into uh, where we initially came from uh, in relation to SOX controls because this is not something that as a business you want to do and basically on a sort of voluntary basis uh, we'll uh, be able to uh, gradually tick some of the boxes we, we were previously, excuse me, uh, perhaps uh, required to, uh, to tick. But in a very brief nutshell, that was given that we don't have much time left. I'm going to hand over to Ellen for a uh, quick close. Yeah, thank you, Christophe. So um, it's well, we, we, we learned a lot um, today about the requirements. We also learned about uh, just uh, just now from Christophe that having a control um, framework in place is key to come to a correct reporting um, and invoicing process. But of course, it's important to know that well, compliance um, and invoicing reporting obligations are not to be looked at in pure isolation. So typically, you need to consider these as part of a broad other APAR implementation process. And, and here we've outlined on the slide, and I will not uh, dwell too long um, on them, uh, a few aspects that need to be taken into account when you are indeed uh, implementing and invoicing an, a reporting solution um, to ensure that that is all being done in a tax compliant manner. Uh, conscious of time, I will now um, move to this part of the presentation um, which i really wanted to uh, show to you uh, let's say as as, some, as kind of a summary slide also linking back to what we've seen in the polling um, results where you indicated well okay we, we don't always feel uh, confident that we have captured all the changes happening we've seen there's a lot of changes happening all over the world um, so i wanted to showcase uh, to you our global e-invoicing e-reporting dash Board, which is a Power BI based tool, um, which helps us visualize for your company to what extent you are impacted by the various reporting invoicing obligations around the world based on your geographical scope, based on your customer segments, etc. Uh, it also zooms in, and that's also very important, it also zooms in to the different technology uh, solutions that are out there on the market that could help you meet the, the, the various requirements that you are um, imposed to, to follow. So, if you are interested in, in having a further discussion uh, with us on, let's say, the various things you, you heard, uh, you heard and, and learned uh, today in terms of uh, local country requirements, in case you want us uh, to give you a further demo on that e-invoicing, e-reporting dashboard, um, and, and how, let's say, your future roadmap of changes for your company looks like, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we would be ha very happy uh, to set up a, a separate conversation with you uh, on that. And I think with that, um, I, I'd like to close uh, the webinar for today. Thank you all very much uh, for your attendance and participation. I hope it was useful. Um, and as I said before, feel free to reach out um, to, to Christoph, myself, to Sven, um, on any aspects that have been uh, discussed today. So for now, thank you and have a very nice day. Bye-bye.